we're finally done talking about the central nervous system. So now we're going to go talk about the peripheral nervous system. So what happens with our nerves outside of our brain and spinal cord? It's important to understand that our peripheral nervous system is broken into two um, main systems. There's the autonomic peripheral nervous system and the somatic peripheral nervous system. So we'll talk about both of these. First, we'll talk about the autonomic. So the autonomic nervous system is everything that runs in the background. It's all the things that you don't have to be conscious of uh, and that you can become conscious of with training, but it's usually the things that you're not really aware of. It's when you're on autopilot. And there's two main components to the autonomic nervous system. There's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems. So the sympathetic system is the system that helps to wind us up. If you think about norepinephrine and that neurotransmitter that gets us wound up, uh, it really helps to charge up the sympathetic nervous system. This is what happens when your heart starts to beat really fast, you start to breathe really fast, your eyes become wide, you're taking in more information through your senses, your muscles become tense, and, and you're ready to run or fight or fly away. Uh, it's when you're really on edge. It's when, when you're really ready to take charge. And so if you think of you in a job interview, your sympathetic nervous system's working. When you're running, when you're uh, writing a test, your sympathetic nervous system's, even if you're not doing something physical, you're cognitively very alert. Now the important thing to know is our species is not hardwired to fully always be in sympathetic. And one of the problems with modern day society is we're fully alert during school, we're fully alert doing work, we're fully at work during family time, we're fully alert during our volunteer stuff, and we never have time to relax. Even when we go home, we're fully alert when we're on social media and we're reading really intense stuff. And it's essential for our neurological health for us to tap into our parasympathetic nervous system once in a while. And so our parasympathetic nervous system is a system that takes place when we calm down, when we relax. It's the system that, that helps us to digest food. And it's a system that helps us to slow our heart rate, to slow and relax our breathing, to ease our muscles. And this is a very important restorative process for our body. It's important that everyone has some time to relax. It's not just sleep. A lot of times in modern society, we don't get enough sleep. And outside of sleep, we're never relaxed. We're go, 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 go. Parasympathetic nervous system is the idea that even when we're conscious, sometimes we need to be mellow. And we will do better if we allow ourselves some mellow time. So these are both parts of the somatic, or these are both parts of the autonomic peripheral nervous system. Now we're going to jump over to the somatic peripheral nervous system. This is the system that we tend to be more conscious of, though we're not always conscious of it. And so this is also broken down to two bits. There's the sensory and the motor house. So the sensory somatic nervous system is our input system. It's how we get information to our central nervous system. So these are things like the intake that comes from our eyes, our skin, our ears, our taste buds, our olfactory bulbs. Uh, so this is how if you everything you're looking at. When we studied introspection, everything you're seeing, everything you're hearing, uh, the temperature you're feeling, all of that stuff is being taken in through the sensory peripheral nervous system into your brain so you can contemplate it and perceive it. Now the peripheral motor nervous system is how your brain sends a message to impact your environment. It's really the output system. So this is how we move. If you want to move your hand, you want to pick up a cup, uh, even if you want to produce speech, that's all coming from your motor system. This is when your brain starts off by giving your peripheral nervous system a message to kick your foot or to wink your eye or, or what have you. So it's really the output system. All right, so now we're going to talk about the endocrine system. And this is a lot more brief than the discussion of the nervous system. So when we talk about the endocrine system, we're really talking about the system in the body uh, where uh, glands secrete and produce and regulate different hormones. And the glands we tend to talk about most in psychology uh, are the ones you can see here. And so we're interested in the pituitary, the penile gland, the thyroid, the adrenal glands, to a lesser extent the pancreas and the gonads. So the pituitary gland, that's of course housed in the brain, uh, it's very close to the hypothalamus and it receives its orders from the hypothalamus. And one of the things it does is it oversees the production of most hormones in our endocrine system. Uh, and so this, in particular, we're going to talk about things like endorphins, that's the uh, pain suppressant neurotransmitter, as well as the human growth hormone, which in children uh, tends to be released at night, which helps them to grow and in adults helps us to repair our tissues, of course. Then also in the brain, but in a different location further back is the penile gland. This helps with things like the production of melatonin, which helps with our circadian rhythm and our wake and sleep cycles. 
Often if there is uh, something going on, if somebody's suffering from insomnia, they may take a melatonin supplement, uh, which could help to regulate that. Another gland we're interested in, of course, is the thyroid gland in the throat. This helps with the regulation of our metabolism and our usage of energy. Also helps with our, our appetite and our growth. Then we have the adrenal glands, which just sit on top of our kidneys, and they are really involved in the production of aldosterone as well as cortisol. There's the pancreas, and this is, of course, in, uh, involved in digestion and the production of insulin and the breakdown of sugars. And finally, the last glands we tend to talk about are the sex glands. And these can be either the ovaries or the testes in a given person. And so the, the ovaries produce uh, hormones such as estrogen and progesterone, versus the testes tend to produce an abundance of testosterone. It's important to note that there are no humans that have both ovaries and testes, though the presentation of ovaries and testes can vary. Some individuals may have testes that are internal, uh, or they may have ovaries that function a little bit different. Now, in terms of which hormones we're most interested in, uh, there are many different hormones, over 60 hormones we tend to discuss, uh, but for the purposes of this course, we're going to talk about four right off the get-go. And so the very first one is cortisol that's produced uh, from the adrenal glands at the top of the kidneys, and this is really what we call the stress hormone. When your cortisol goes up, you tend to see an increase in your sympathetic nervous system, that's your arousal nervous system, you tend to be more alert, more awake, more stressed, your breathing's more intense, uh, and with really heightened cortisol level, this, this can make someone very easy to stress and burn out. So we want to see cortisol levels drop when you engage with that parasympathetic nervous system. Some people, of course, have chronically high cortisol levels and chronically high stress levels. Then we're also interested in oxytocin. Oxytocin is often called the pleasure hormone. We see it released when you do something pleasurable like eating chocolate, but also when you hug or kiss or cuddle someone that you enjoy doing those activities with. It also is a hormone released when you are socially bonding, when you have a really fulfilling conversation or a vulnerable discussion with someone you trust. However, oxytocin is also released in some really interesting scenarios. Uh, some researchers have found it's released when you fire a gun. Uh, and so there's a lot uh, to unpack in this pleasure hormone. Then we have estrogen. So estrogen is often considered an emotional response. It's involved in fertility, uh, the production of ovums in the uterus. Uh, but it also seems to have some protective facts. It may be protective from the symptoms of schizophrenia. That is, people who may be at risk of schizophrenia but have high levels of estrogen may be less likely to develop schizophrenia, and it's only when the estrogen goes down those symptoms might uh, start to develop. And the final one we're going to talk about in this unit is testosterone. Testosterone is often tied to sexual desire as well as to being highly competitive, and in some situations being very aggressive. Uh, so it's different from oxytocin. Oxytocin may want to make someone cuddle, versus testosterone is much more about a sexual uh, sort of desire. Now, how we go about measuring these hormones, uh, it tends to be a lot less invasive than our brain mapping technologies. Uh, some of the things we might do is through uh, drawing a sample of blood, of course, but we may also measure uh, the cortisol, for instance, we can measure in your saliva, just doing a cheek swab or, or just getting a little bit of spit in a jar can measure your cortisol. Uh, we can also measure hormones in your urine and we can also measure it on the sweat. So we can, we can, measure, we can measure the conductivity um, in your sweat of different hormones as well.